Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on December 20th. Just a reminder, this is all in the realism overall set of mods for Kerbal Space Program so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The full mod list is in the video description. As you can see, I was preparing for the SpaceX Orbcom 2 launch during this stream and I was gonna stream it, but actually it ended up being delayed on Sunday and I streamed it on Monday, but it didn't end up being part of the stream even though I did have the countdown clock going there. The main thing for this stream was to launch two viewer submitted payloads to Mars, but before I did that, I, I was preparing a payload right there, but before I launched it, I decided to fix up my Titan lander, which I had launched in the previous episode, and here you see me making its mid-course adjustment plot and checking out how much Delta V it would take to get into orbit around Saturn. Right there it cost 2000 but I decided to check out whether bringing it closer into Saturn might help. Now we have way more than the Delta V that you see at the bottom there, it's not just 2800, we've got a tank locked. So we've got plenty of fuel, in theory, but landing on Titan is tough. So I want to make sure to get as close to Saturn as possible, hopefully that's not so close that's dangerous, and then how much does this version cost? Uh, about 1,400. So it saved us about 600 meters per second getting into orbit around Saturn. And of course, we're not going to be uh, air braking around Saturn. That would be dangerous. So we're just going to use fuel in order to get into orbit. And there's me making the mid-course adjustment and getting it as close to the intended orbit as possible. So nice and tight around Saturn. And we'll have this add to alarm clock and check on it later. Technically that wasn't a mid-course adjustment, that was right outside of Earth SOI by the way. Anyway, this is a payload by Bluegill Bronco 2 and it's a long-range Mars communication relay which will be obviously very helpful for our future missions. It's got RTGs rather than solar panels, six of them amazingly enough. Uh, I've had to tune up the multi-hundred watt RTGs. They only had 150 watts to them and that doesn't sound like multi hundred watt to me so I just doubled their output to 300 watts which at least is multi hundred watt. Um, uh, I haven't done that here though so you see that the power uh, generation and drain the, the, it's not the best sort of situation right now and so that's why it's after launching these payloads that I decided to up the power of it. Anyway uh, so you see here I've got an RL10 stage at the bottom and then an Estes stage I snuck in there and then I have to figure out how to get it to fit on the Falcon 9 launcher inside the payload fairing. So that's why I ended up having to size the RL-10 stage like this, a flat disc rather than a normal tank. And again, that's so it could fit in the fairing. Here we've got another payload from a viewer. This is the Mom Propaganda BMW from Thy Lord Root, also destined for Mars. One will be, this one will be set in a polar orbit, the other one in an equatorial orbit and we're launching the monopropaganda first. So here we go on a Falcon 9, both are being launched on a Falcon 9, and this is Falcon 9 version 1.2, so upgrade version. Okay, ignition and launch. Now at this point I haven't done uh, recovery testing with the Falcon 9 first stage, but I, I did that in this recent weekend, so December 27th. Unfortunately, I haven't actually landed it at all. Uh, it's really hard because of the high thrust just of a single engine on the Falcon 9 stage it tends to want to start going up so either the tanks are too light or the engines don't throttle down as much as they really do so I'm gonna have to work on that I need the a single Merlin 1D to throttle down enough so that it'll start going down. The, the first stage actually has to go down when the single engine is thrown down. Anyway, separation. And there is a Merlin 1D vacuum. And we've got the nice engine models here from Starshine Inc, I think it is, or Starshine Industries. And there is the Mod Propaganda BMW on top of its transfer stage. Its transfer stage has, a, has an RL-10, but also a built-in um, hypergolic stage. It's using the two FASA advanced Gemini lander engines, which we have seen in a previous episode. And so continuing to orbit, getting close to orbit here. Uh, 
and there we go we have made orbit 271 by 229 or about 230 there and uh, we can separate the stage and we could relight the second stage if you want to if we thought there was enough delta V to use but uh, no point with that amount there so I extend the the solar panel pylons so that they're out of the way of the dishes and then extend the solar panels and with that Dilord Roots payload is in space and ready for its plot to Mars and here I am plotting its course and there we go that's how it will encounter Mars this is a mid-course adjustment costing about 850 meters per second that we're going to have to do so the total amount to get to Mars in this case is about 4,300 meters per second. Okay, and here is Bluegill Bronco 2's launch of the long, long range Mars communication relay. Okay, getting ready for ignition, ignition, and launch. So this is obviously another Falcon 9, but the upper stages are configured differently. And so we'll see which version is better. Uh, hopefully both versions do get their payload over to Mars but maybe one will perform better than the other so the other one had an integrated hypergolic stage built in instead of two separate stages and this one has two separate stages it's got the RL10 first and then a second stage Estes engine so and that'll tell us a lot about what our future configurations for other Mars launches should be and of course we're going to be doing plenty of launches to Mars, we're going to have to send a lot of hardware over there. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of staging we should uh, adopt. Okay, here we go. Separation and ignition of the Merlin 1D vacuum. All looking good. And the reason why this question, I mean, you would normally think that if you stage them separately, you know, you dump the RL-10 stage first and then go to the hypergolic stage, you might think that that would be better. But then there is the question of the mass of the SS engine, uh, the amount of room it takes in the fairing, right? Because the SS engine is quite large compared to the little Gemini uh, lander engines, which are, can be radially placed. They are surface mounted. So because of the extra room that the SS engine takes in the fairing that that takes up space that could be used by fuel and so that's and you can see it there uh, taking up that space and that was the reason why the RL-10 stage had to be formed in that kind of disc instead of with the mono propaganda in which case it looks like a normal tank so that is why there is this question okay that is the end of that burn and you can see how small the tank for the SS engine is it's just a very small hypergolic stage and so if you could slip that onto the RL-10 stage that might be more beneficial. You can see here the hypergolic stage is at the bottom of the of the main tank for the RL-10 stage. It's that little silver portion. So here we go on uh, the Mars burn transit to Mars for the Ma Propaganda BMW from Dialer Root. Also interesting is the fact that this obviously uses solar panels while the other one uses RTGs. And uh, we'll see their relative performance based on those power options. Okay, so we are on our way to Mars with this one. It'll need that mid-course adjustment and of course I have to fix that mid-course adjustment now that we've actually done the burn. And again we want to get this one into a polar orbit and that looks pretty good right there. Not quite polar but that, well, that's a little bit better isn't it we'll have to tweak it once we get there anyway yeah but uh, you can see the precision precision that is necessary for this sort of thing alright and then the long-range Mars communication relay and uh, we're going to plot that out we hadn't done the plot yet there we go it's about the same sort of thing. It's not a Holman transfer, it's a little bit off. And again, this one we're going to get in an equatorial orbit. We don't have any other communication satellites around Mars, I should point out. Okay, there we go. And checking out what it takes to get into orbit around Mars there. 
It does take a lot, so again, I try and get as close to Mars as possible to see how much that costs. Still costs about 3,000. So it's going to cost a lot to get into orbit around Mars if we don't air break it. Air breaking is an option in this case, but it is a risky option. Okay, we have ignition of the RL-10 stage. You can see that I put solar panels on the RL-10 stage, and that's because of our nervousness about the RTGs and the fact that they weren't uh, producing as much power as we thought they should. We talked about this in stream. Um, six RTGs should be more than enough to power a communication relay satellite like this, but apparently it was rather close. So that's why I put the solar panels there. Okay, well, we've got a nice close... Well, after our mid-course correction, we will have a nice close pass to Mars, and we'll have that correction in our alarm clock queue. Okay, well, with everybody else sending stuff to Mars, I thought it would be a good idea for me to send something. Both of those satellites were communication satellites. I decided that I wanted to send a surface scanner, because of course we want to do in-situ resource utilization on Mars, and that means that I want to get something to scan those resources on Mars. Hopefully, Mars, unlike Duna in my colonization series, actually has water or any, uh, well, ore, anyway. And I also wanted to send over a lander to test the inline balutes. So what we have on the top of the lander there, that there's a huge cylinder there, which is actually a, a, a combination of a balloon parachute. It's sort of a different kind of way to uh, do re-entry, and so we're gonna test it out. I have no idea how it worked. Uh, for reasons I'm not entirely sure, maybe I was getting tired, I decided to shape the tank in an unconventional way because the smooth cone option in procedural tanks, procedural parts, has a wasted option, and so, well, I decided to use it for the first time ever. And we ended up with, well, it initially was looking like a pear, then it ended up some people saying uh, looking like a gourd or a milk bottle. Uh, anyway, it looks like something. I ended up calling it a pear because that was the first comparison mentioned. Here I'm putting on boosters because we needed a little bit more oomph to get this payload to orbit. The launcher can handle 20 tons, this payload is more than that. And so we've got two boosters there with parachutes on top and we'll see if stage recovery can recover those for us. So that's something else we're testing. Alright, here we are. This is the Kingfisher launcher with two boosters. Uh, some overheating there, but nothing too critical. That happens sometimes on the launch pad. There's still 1.0.4, by the way. Okay, ignition of the M1 and the boosters. By the way, you can see that by now I have been informed that the SpaceX launch had been delayed to Monday, and so our countdown now has a full day on it. So one day, two hours, and three minutes or so. The Kingfisher performing quite well here. You can see reasonable G-forces at this point as the SRBs are running out. And the question is SRB set. Now I was getting tired at this point and separation was a bit tighter than I initially intended. Those, those uh, separatrons really needed to be moved a little bit further up, obviously. Okay, here the M1 stage is running out. Obviously, now all of this is uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Very high ISP. And ignition of the J2X. Now we will try to recover the J2X. We had failed to do that in a previous attempt. But I reinstalled everything. I updated realism overhaul and real fuels. And so hopefully that will change the situation a little bit and make it possible to recover this this stage. It's just the bottom of it that we're trying to recover, just the engine really. And if we can recover this, we can hopefully also recover the Halcyon capsule, which also perished in the previous episode. Now, it was about this time that I realized that I made a grievous error about my payload. I was supposed to attach a long-range antenna to the pair. Actually, the indentation in the pair was supposed to have the antenna right there but I don't have that here, so this can't communicate directly to Earth from, from its long-distance interplanetary flight. And I've got an RL-60 at the bottom of the pair, by the way, 
just in case you were wondering about that engine. So, uh, basically an upgraded RL10 if you'd like. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of a problem. It might have to rely, it might have to have no communication along the way and then rely on the other launches to communicate back once it gets to Mars SOI. But I'm still not sure what to do about this, so I've temporarily left it in Earth orbit until I can figure out what to do. I'll ponder that another time. For now, we are going to return this second stage and see if it can re-enter now that I've updated the mods, actually created an entirely new install in the hope that it would solve my heat problems. So I shut down the J2X. Actually, somebody pointed out that I could have deorbited the tank instead of leaving it uh, there. I, the J2X can relight, so we could have used it to turn the tank retrograde, deorbit, and then proceed with this portion. And I'll have to remember to do that in future launches, though I didn't do it on the December 27th stream, I failed again. Okay, here we go, we are re-entering. As you can see, this is about the altitude where it burned up before, and it survives here. And gets lower, 55 kilometers. We are getting to higher G-forces here, 2.5 Gs, and building. Here we are at peak G load, about 7.8 G's, 36 kilometers altitude. Uh, that sure looks like the Sahara to me, so I think it is. Now, I, I, I don't have to directly control it. Uh, Smart ASS I've told to hold to the negative relative velocity marker, so the retrograde marker basically, surface retrograde. And we have passed through the heat, so reinstall was successful. And now we don't have the same heat issues. Hopefully we can bring back the Halcyon Pob. Oh, by the way, stage recovery did take care of the boosters. So we did recover our boosters. They had a terminal velocity of 5 meters per second with those parachutes. So we will look forward to using those boosters again. Here we go. Parachutes out. The J2 twitching a bit. And all looks well. So let's see if it can survive impact. Well, at those velocities it definitely should. Very slow very gentle and there we are okay we can recover that and so that did it for the December 20th stream we launched two payloads to Mars, two viewer payloads to Mars uh, completed their launches and their trans Mars injection and then I launched my own scanner probe to orbit but we have to be concerned about how it's actually going to do getting to Mars so a little bit of a flub there but anyway Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.